Welcome to the Hair of the Dog podcast. I'm your host, Nicole Bagley. And today on our episode, we are talking all about PR. Now, PR is so much more valuable than any sort of paid advertising because, well, you can't pay for it. But with the help of Zoe Heljemark today, who is going to help us guide us on this PR journey. Um, if you have a business or you want more eyes on your business or more awareness, well, you're not going to want to miss this episode. Stay tuned. Hey everybody, Nicole here from Hair of the Dog and welcome back to yet another Hair of the Dog podcast. Today, I'm very excited about our special guest, Zoe Hilgemark. I think I said that last name correctly. We had a little lesson before <laughs> because I am notorious for butchering <laughs> Scandinavian or like Dutch names are really, really hard. So Zoe, hi, welcome Hello. to the podcast. You said it perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> yay. Yay. And just to um, clarify, it's not me that's actually Scandinavian. It's my husband. It's a name I've inherited there. So um, yeah, <laughs> for the last sort of 15 years, I've been having to always tell people like how I say my name and how you spell it. It's, you know, I had a much easier name when I was, um, before I was married, you know, an English straightforward name. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, it's all good. It, it's a good conversation starter. <laughs> it is. Um, but yeah, but thanks for being here on the podcast. Your specialty is that of public relations. So can you just kind of take a minute to let us know a little bit about who you are and, and what you do before we get into this? Absolutely. Well, sure. And thank you so much um, for having me on the podcast. Absolute honor. I Yeah, so basically what I do is I help uh, professional photographers um, with their publicity and their marketing activity. Um, I would say that I'm a specialist in PR because I've been doing it my entire career, and that is actually nearly 20 years this year. I basically love writing. I was fascinated by psychology when I was like younger and studied that at university, and I studied communications. So it kind of like pulls together all my interests, my love of, of writing and sharing and telling stories and helping to promote businesses. And that my experience early on was just more broad. Working with photographers now since 2015 really allows me to sort of zone in on a particular industry, which I love. I love being, you know, sort of very focused on that one industry. And uh, yeah, how, how I help uh, photographers is really to sort of promote themselves and build brand awareness, build visibility for their businesses. Like, because we all know we need to be seen, we need to be visible. And that is what I help people to do. I love it. Yeah, 100%. And I think uh, PR is one of those areas where a lot of photographers don't really focus, maybe because they don't know sure. how, or it seems really overwhelming. So hopefully we're going to shed some light on that um, here today. But curious how you niche down into photography. Did, do you love photography or was there something else that kind of helped you end up in this niche? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, a bit of both. But I think, you know, fate just kind of steps in sometimes, doesn't it? And I think um, at no point have I ever been a photographer. I absolutely have a passion for photography and beautiful imagery. And my home is full of obviously my portraits of my family, but also landscapes wildlife right. pictures things like that so I do, I do love pictures um, and photography of all, of all genres basically but my background is in the marketing side as I've already mentioned and it just literally became about because life kind of came that way like um, right. I met my first client when she was my newborn photographer so I had a son just over 10 years ago now and my whole life, I was not aware that newborn photography was a thing up until that point. Right. And then, of course, I went through the emotion and the joy of, of birthing of my first child. And this precious little person, this bundle in my arms was like the most amazing, special thing. And I just was so overwhelmed with that love for this new baby that was in my arms. I was like, I have to take some photos. Genuinely, until that point, I hadn't even thought about hiring a newborn photographer. Now, we are talking 10 odd years ago. You know, it's such a bigger thing now, newborn photography. So it is hopefully something that people think about way before the baby's actually right. born. So you can get booked in with your photographer of choice. But luckily, I was blessed with having just literally down the road, like 10 minutes away, an absolutely top-notch photographer called Karen Wiltshire. And when I had this baby in my, I can even picture the moment, and I, my mum was in the room with me, helping me kind of cope with all the newborn life, you know, <laughs> right. things that I was kind of experiencing. 
And I said, I've just got to get some pictures. And, and we looked online, found this, this lady, as I say, I chose Karen Wiltshire, because how I really felt that her work stood out. It was just absolutely stunning, in my opinion. So called her up, and luckily, she squeezed me in. And it just kind of all snowballed from there, because I built a great rapport with Karen. I loved the work that she did for me. I went on very quickly afterwards to actually go have two more kids, because I was blessed with twins just less than a year <laughs> and a half later. So I was like a repeat customer at this point. Right? <laughs> um, and, you know, we had baby portraits, we had the twin portraits, we had family portraits. And, and I just loved everything that she did. But, you know, obviously with my marketing head on, once I kind of got out of the maternity leave mentality, right. I just was like, Karen, I absolutely adore what you're doing, as did all her other clients. But there's so much more that you could potentially do with your marketing. And as you're saying, like PR, is that something photographers even think of? Well, right. In Karen's case, it wasn't. And in most photographers, you know, certainly 10 years ago, it wasn't even on their radar. Yeah. So I just felt like I had a natural ability with what the experience that I had. At that point, I had like 10 years of PR experience, like national, international experience. And I could absolutely apply it to her business and really help her achieve some some good things. And and we did. And she she went for it. She em not employed me, but hired me as a consultant. Yeah. And it kind of just went from there. And I'm so, so grateful to her because she really got me into the industry, to be honest. She opened my eyes to the fact that there was this beautiful little, um, not even little, but, you know, beautiful industry where people are so talented and creating the most beautiful photography and, and photos for their clients, but perhaps might have been struggling to kind of get the word out. And yeah, with my experience, with the skills that I could bring to the table, I felt like I could help them. And yeah, in the case of Karen, I did. And we got local PR, we got national publicity as well. She was in like the Daily Mail um, and some of these big name newspapers, which actually would cost you thousands of pounds yeah. to get featured in, even with just an ad. And we all know what right. we do with ads. We just flick past them, don't we? We right. them if we can. We certainly don't read them. So editorial, sort of actual written articles have so much more value, if you like, um, in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, people are interested and will read it. Yeah, we got got her in Grazia, France. You know, we got all sorts of different publications, blogs, and she was just blown away by, by this all. And I'm not trying to big myself up here, but she genuinely sort of said, wow, this is amazing, you know, and, and <laughs> very, very kindly sort of recommended me to other photographers. And I didn't perhaps realise in my naivety going into it how well connected she was in particular, but also how right. closely, um, close-knit the photography industry is, certainly here in the UK. Mm -hmm. um and everyone knows everyone basically you all go to the same award ceremonies you're all part of the same photography associations etc so yeah I I was very very lucky in a way that Karen had my back really and could put in a good word and it kind of just went from there I think funnily enough the next person that hired me off Karen's recommendation actually was a pet photographer yeah and so, yeah, that lurched me straight into that. So it was slightly different to the work I was doing for Karen, but still still very much in the photography niche. And I love that, you know, just as much. And uh, for this particular lady, she'd been struggling to get any marketing traction, any any clients and inquiries coming in. It was, it was a part-time thing for her, but she still wanted to kind of get visibility. And I was so pleased that we just did such a tiny project together. We just literally, uh, I can't even remember how much I charged her, but it, it wasn't a lot, but... I got her a double page spread editorial in her local paper and she was like, thank you, because she had been trying to get in that publication for ages. And it's not that I've got magic wand that I can just, you know, shake and fairy dust, you know, makes it happen. And it, it wasn't even that I had connections with that particular newspaper. But I think just knowing how to approach the media and knowing how to do it really, really helps. So, yeah, that was that was a real boost. And then it kind of like I say, it just snowballed from there. So I've just worked with photographers ever since. Karen certainly helped me in those early stages. And then I niched my own messaging. Um, and I've, all my marketing has been obviously focused towards photographers for several years now. Since 2015, I think I officially kind of became niched down. A few yeah. years prior to that, I was kind of, shall I, shan't I niche? I think your <laughs> pet photographers can all probably relate to that. It's like, when do you dare take right. the leap? Right. When do you yeah. move on from being just a portrait photographer or a wedding photographer, whatever it is that you might have been before uh, or done simultaneously, you know, with your pet mm -hmm. photography? So when do you take that that leap? And yeah, anyway, yeah, 2015. That happened, 
that happened to me 2015 as well when I oh really found, yeah I was um I started my business in 2010 I did families and pets because I didn't think pet photography could be a thing because back then there were like two pet photographers in the whole entire United States um so right like, oh. and it's still it's still one of those things where man I think there's so much potential benefit for PR for pet photographers because I can't tell you how many people I still meet that say, wait, what, you're a dog photographer? <laughs> like they, it doesn't connect yet. It's not like a, you know, like family photography, newborn photography is becoming more mainstream where people know yeah. that it exists, where mm-hmm. a lot of people still don't understand that pet photography exists. And then from that PR aspect, I mean, everybody loves cat videos, dog videos, <laughs> like talking about their dog. Like it, it's, be much harder for you, I think, if you were like, I'm going to be a PR expert for accountants. <laughs> yeah, and potentially more boring, but not if that floats your boat. But yeah, yeah. That's certainly not my thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, totally. And I think, you know, you tell you about watching the videos and things. I mean, I literally spend all my Saturday and Sunday mornings for about 25 minutes with my daughter every weekend looking at stupid cat reels. And, yes. <laughs> just like we love it I know my family we have a family texturing that we just send each other basically really silly cat like voiceover cat reels (laughs) of of usually cats beating up dogs (laughs) it's it's so funny um I love it I love it I love it so yeah so one of the things so my background prior to becoming a photographer is I worked in the zoological industry so we were a small organization. It's the National Aviaries where I worked most of like seven years. Um, and we were a small organization and we had a, a PR person there that okay. I ended up working fairly closely with to, you know, do press releases on new programs, on new hatchings, on like mm-hmm. new exhibits, like all sorts of newsworthy things. So I started to get a little bit more knowledge just around the fact that that exists mm-hmm. and how much like a lot of the media needs stories, you know, they need to fill up their paper or their magazines. And we are in a pretty lucky spot that we have something fun to offer them to, you know, absolutely to to cover. Yeah, Yeah, completely. And I think pet photographers in particular, because I mean, newborn photography, that's all well and good. People love looking at pictures of their own babies. Some people love looking at other people's babies, but not so much. But pets right, is a bit right. more like it becomes universe. weird. If they like looking at other people's babies too much, <laughs> that becomes inappropriate and stock-like. <laughs> yeah, and like family portraits, you know, they're so meaningful to you, you know, right. as the individual is to your family. And it, and it applies the same for pets, but I think there's just such more of a universal appeal, isn't there, for mm-hmm. pets? And whether it's the same breed as your pet or, you know, there's some kind of connection or particular interest. But um, it, it's just so, so advantageous to have beautiful imagery to share with the media, because quite frankly, to your point earlier about working with like accountants or something, you've really got to get the interest of the journalist. This is the whole point, mm-hmm. right, when you're pitching. And if you've got a really compelling image to be honest, half of the work is almost done in a sense. Um, and as a PR agency, working in PR agencies in the past but half of our battle was like right god how do we make this really dull concept or dull company right and we would never say our clients were dull obviously but you right, know right, internally right. we were just like how can we make this interesting right. um and sometimes the the press coverage may literally have been a picture story meaning that it was just one picture with a short caption they weren't necessarily mm-hmm. writing mm-hmm. much about the story that we were trying to share with them but the hook you know the visual hook was there and likewise just talking uh, yesterday to a journalist who's after photography because they want to not necessarily have pages and pages of boring looking text right you know, journalists magazines they want beautiful pages that people can flick through and enjoy looking through so the fact that you guys have all those fantastic images to play with puts you in a math at a massive advantage i would argue and indeed that article that double page spread i mentioned for like one of my really early clients you know, it was seven, eight, probably nine photos from her archive, you know, of, right. of client work. And that, yeah. that's why it was a double page spread, because they were like, probably they couldn't decide which ones to cut. So they just used them all. <laughs> but that's what you've got to your advantage as photographers, but specifically pet photographers, because, you know, who doesn't want to look at a 
cute pet. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. One of the other things that I found that was often very press worthy is I grew my business with charitable marketing. So partnering with other nice. rescues um, or other charities. And I found that our local press where I was living was much more apt to cover anything that had that charitable slant because it was no longer like the focus of the benefit was not necessarily on my business, even though it was indirectly, (laughs) but the focus was on this, you know, nonprofit that everybody feels good supporting. Yeah. Um, Are there, do you have recommendations to help people like kind of start to brainstorm of what could be press worthy or like, how does, you know, if I'm a pet photographer, how do I even start figuring out how to move forward? Of course we can hire you and everybody should. (laughs) Oh, thank you. But But how do we even start? Obviously that's not an option. Yeah, no, we get that. I mean, I do work with photographers, but very happily, you know, hear from any of your listeners if they're interested, but I'm very much about empowering photographers to help themselves do this because, you know, spread the love and share the intel and all for that because actually you know it is possible for you to do your own PR and in fact yeah. you're doing your own PR to an extent anyway but putting out social media you know maybe you're interviewed on podcasts like I am on this one this is this is all sort of PR any collaborations you do with pet industry businesses for example this is all great visibility you know in, inducing work so this is all part of the PR umbrella in a way right. um, and you can absolutely do it yourself but to your question of you know other ways I mean the charity angle is yes a strong one because as you say you're deflecting the attention but you're still getting a little bit Mm -hmm. of connection and it's all good to be putting you know positive vibes out into the world and supporting local charities so that is always something that is a great uh, way of you know getting in the press potentially I mean back in the day I remember doing a lot of like check presentation type stories you know where the uh, charity would be holding the check and be presented Mm -hmm. that you know by the relevant company and you know there may have been a story around that but you don't see so many of those these days because thankfully so many millions of brilliant people are donating money to charity and doing good things and quite frankly these publications can't just be full of those kind of stories but you can certainly leverage that as a PR opportunity as a content opportunity you know you can be creating blogs and all sorts of different things about why you're teaming up with the charity. Perhaps there's an angle there that's of interest. Like why have you even chosen that charity in the first place? Mm-hmm. Sharing, you know, their great work. Maybe you could be interviewing the CEO of the charity or the founder, you know, what is it that they're trying to achieve and how is that improving pets' lives? Or, you know, if it's a pet charity, how is it actually helping? But yeah, I mean, the key thing to remember to approach your own PR is really like you are different to the next photographer down the road or in the next city or whatever and it's very easy to forget that when you're sat at home perhaps editing into the small hours and you know thinking oh everybody's doing the same my work's no different or she's charging more than me or she's charging less or whatever and you start to get in your head about it Mm -hmm. and I think it's really really important to sort of take a step back and go right the differentiator of my business is me is my approach is how I do things why I've started my business, which is going to be a different story again to, you know, that next photographer down the road. So I think it's remembering your your point of differentiation from any other photographers in your space, actually, and thinking, right, this in itself could potentially be of interest. And certainly if you're celebrating like a 10th anniversary of your business, 20 years, five years, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. that in itself is an angle that could interest the media. So I mean, what I would hope is that if anyone is sitting and listening to this and thinking, I've got nothing to say to the media, just even think about that. Like, how long have you been in business? Or are you just starting your business? The launch phase of your business is a great time to get press. You don't have to wait until you're like 5, 10, 15 years in, actually. Um, mm, that's a great point. I think there's a big fear around, oh, I'm not big enough. I'm not established right. enough. You know, I, I need more clients. I need to have earned a certain amount of money before I will consider myself an expert before I consider that I'm enough to be of interest to someone else. Um, And yeah, I remember helping a few years back now, but a photographer, not in the pet space, but um, girl photography, portraits specifically of girls. And this lady was just launching. She was a photographer before. She was just repositioning her business. She was niching down. Mm -hmm. Um, But effectively, it was a launch of a new brand, a new business, uh, albeit she had the, the expertise and experience. 
But we treated it as a brand new business and we did a lot of PR around this new business launching and we got loads of press locally, you know, in regional magazines. We got her photos on front covers of, you know, family parenting mags, that kind of thing, which was perfect for her PR. And it was a really good sort of launch pad, to be honest, for this new brand. Right. Um, So absolutely, you can be starting out fresh and you can still get press potentially. Or you can be celebrating a a landmark, a milestone, an exciting collaboration. There's loads of things within even just your own story, your business story that you could use. And that's without kind of leveraging trending topics, trending news. You know, Mm -hmm. have have you got an opinion on something that's breaking, that's relevant to the industry? Celebrity pets, you know, there's something (laughs) there that you could kind of hook onto that might be breaking in the media, for example. There's loads of other stuff as well, other ways that you can get into the media. But yeah, I really wanted to stress that point that people shouldn't be sat there waiting for like a certain time to do this. That's a huge point because I bet a lot of our listeners out there had that thought go through their head of, I don't have anything newsworthy, you know, or what's different about me, or I'm too new in my business, or my business has been around too long, or it's too this or that, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. It's so easy to just find that as it's almost like we're finding that excuse as a way to give us an excuse to be like, oh, okay. Like (laughs) to not even have to to go forward with it because we tend to procrastinate on things that we don't know how to do. Or maybe we have a little fear around it of like, oh, are we going to get rejected? Is anyone going to pick it up? What happens if they do pick it up? Yeah, absolutely. So, that fear of rejection yeah. is massive, isn't it? And and fear in general, because there's fears of the visibility if it right. goes to, you know, to actually work out for you and you're in the, you know, do you want to be in the press? You know, not me, not my face. I just want my work. But, you know, sometimes, yes, it will lead with your photography, but other times it will also, they will want to see the, the human behind yeah. the brand, behind the story as well. So you do have to be at a certain level of comfort of showing your face you know potentially right. you might want to be submitting images of yourself or they come back to you with some interest but they want your headshot you know and, and you've got to be okay with that yeah there's lots of fears around PR and as you say rejection is a huge huge part of that because to be honest you are going to get rejected if, if you right. consider rejection as you're not going to get a response or you're going to get ignored that's uh-huh. going to happen I can absolutely guarantee because you right. need to probably pitch like a hundred publications to get in say 10 you know right. it's, that's just the reality um so I think you just have to try and get over that and you know I think it's just facing your fears isn't it and as you say trying not to procrastinate on things that perhaps have a fear associated with them but, mm-hmm. but when you know it might genuinely really change your business if you suddenly got featured in xyz magazine yeah. Um, or, you know, be interviewed on a podcast or feature on a blog, you know, suddenly that could improve your visibility to a phenomenal scale, potentially. I and mean, we're not all going to become superstars overnight with just right. one or two pieces of press. But if you're comfortable and can dare to kind of put yourself out there, I do really feel the rewards are there. So it is about facing your fears and being comfortable with a certain degree of rejection. Yeah. Um, but also like trying not to internalize that rejection at all, because at the end of the day, if a journalist ignores your email, as they will, like most will, <laughs> right, um, right. it's not about you. It's not a rejection right. of you. It's not a rejection of even your story. They may have loved the idea, but just had ran something similar recently, uh-huh, or right. they may not cover that patch anymore that they used to. You know, you thought that journalist perhaps was the perfect thing because they did perfect person on a particular right. publication. But actually, they've moved on. They've been promoted to news editor or something, and they're no longer, you know, lifestyle editor, for example. So it's half the time or more, it's never about you, actually. Right, right. um, And that that lesson can actually carry over way beyond PR and basically through our entire life. (laughs) That Most things are not about us. And um, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) even though we tend to make it so. (laughs) <laughs> absolutely yeah same social media you know you're not getting engagement on your posts uh-huh. oh it's all about me my posts are rubbish no one likes me no it's not it's just yeah. that you know yeah. algorithms you know different things right yeah so, for sure um, yeah so it's it is really important to try and face your fears but it's easy for me to say that because obviously I've been doing this my whole career and you know maybe <laughs> it, completely, it you know, does but. get easier back in my zoo days I mean I used to take penguins on the morning shows like 
Oh, and be at the yeah it was it's really fun um <laughs> so it just becomes one of those things that like the more you do it it's just becomes it's probably like actually your first photography session you know how nervous yeah. were we the first couple times we went out to photograph somebody's dog and you know maybe we still get nervous I mean I still get a little bit of nerves before a session sometimes of like yeah oh, I hope I can still make something nice <laughs> mm, completely and if you didn't have yeah. that actually something would be a bit wrong wouldn't it because right. you, you're just so blase about it that it's almost like you don't care enough right um, right right you know, it is yeah. important to feel those butterflies, isn't it, in your tummy and be excited about the work you're going to do. Yes, yeah. there might be an f- element of fear or danger, you know, involved. You know, <laughs> will I will I get the shot or will the will it not happen, you know, on right. that particular shoot? Yeah. I love it. Real quick before we go into the next part, one of the things for brainstorming topics, would figuring out like something that we could teach, like, you know, how to take better photos of your pet with your phone or, you know, things like that. I would imagine that would be pretty press worthy and um, some organizations would love to have content like that. Definitely. So it depends what you're trying to achieve because any PR comes back to, before you start, you absolutely should be thinking Mm -hmm. about what's my objective here. So as a pet photographer, if you're trying to secure clients, your objective from a PR point of view is to get clients, you know, track clients. You're not going to want to share particularly well, not go heavy on it anyway, not going to be sharing tips and giving away all your best uh, advice so that they can potentially recreate photos of their own. You might want to hint at what you can offer them, yeah. um, but you don't want to be giving away all your best secrets. But if your business objective is slightly different because, say, you mentor photographers or you help other photo- aspiring photographers become professional pet photographers, yeah. then your target market is going to be other photographers or aspiring photographers. They are going to read different media and they are going to want to know how you create the, your awesome images. So you're going to right. have a slightly different message. So I'm not trying to suggest that you shouldn't give away tips and advice, because I do believe very much in share what you know, because that's yeah. what actually attracts people to you. You know, you can demonstrate your expertise and things. But yeah, it's really how to's like tutorials. Absolutely. That is another really great way. Similarly, you might get in the press by doing a review, like an honest or potentially even critical review of something, you know, whether it's software that might be of interest to photography media. If you tried out some new software or a tool or a business app that, you know, you, you've discovered that you think might be of interest to other photographers as well. You know, a photography magazine could well be interested in your review of that. And I do well, work with um, commercial photographers who get sponsored or, or get actually provided free kit, free things, lighting, setups and things to try out. And then they write up their reviews of kit and things. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's lots, I mean, there's so many different ways, but yeah. yeah Teaching what you it. know is always a great idea because to a certain extent, you don't want to give away everything, but you do want to intrigue and attract, you know. Yeah. Right and show, yeah, kind of. Mm. Uh, set you up I would imagine as an authority on the subject too absolutely yeah yeah Yeah. this is what it's all about isn't it it's the visibility side of it and that's what I really believe I help photographers do is whether I'm working with them or whether they're just following me you know I'm Uh hopefully helping to inspire them to get visible more visible because that builds that authority um Mm -hmm. and yeah I think that authority is what then ultimately wants them to work with you because they perceive you as that expert yeah. Um, and by de- doing that thought leadership stuff, that putting out that expert content on your blog, you know, in your PR articles, if you go down that route, you're telling people that, yeah, this is my niche. This is my expertise. This is what I know. And for sure, that's going to be more compelling to a potential client than, you know, if they were comparing two photographers and you were doing all that, the PR and the marketing piece and, and the other photographer wasn't, but was saying, look, just come and hire me. This is what I can create. Right. We all know who we'd, we'd go with. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah, I love that. All right, so we have some ideas of what we can possibly be press worthy. How do you possibly start to figure out who to send it to? <laughs> I feel like that's where everybody would be like, okay, great. Now I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. And you're going to literally need to create a kind of what we call a media list. So you need to understand what media are going to be interested in what you have to share. So obviously any kind of pet specific media are going to be potentially interested. So we're talking pet magazines, pet blogs, um, 
there's also going to be influencers on say Instagram and things like that who maybe have a big following that you might want to be kind of getting in touch with maybe collaborations that kind of thing but ultimately who is creating content that where your photography your mm-hmm. news stories could fit in nicely um, so there's clearly that kind of niche kind of media but beyond that I would say we've all got local newspapers wherever we live wherever we live in the world local newspapers still exist they haven't completely died a death quite yet um and you know there's regional media there's national media there's international newspapers and publications so but i would always say don't kind of look down on your local press Mm -hmm. because it's a great place to start and it's a great place to cut your teeth in terms of learning what the media want um Mm -hmm. and what might be considered newsworthy so I think it's difficult when people go, oh, I want to be featured in the New York Times or, you know, I want to be featured in the Daily Mail. And and that's like their number one objective. Um, If you're starting from scratch, just aim a bit smaller, (laughs) like be realistic. But you are genuinely of interest to your local community if you're doing something newsworthy. If you know, raising money for a local charity or you are a local business, you know, the, the local press do want to support and champion Mm -hmm. local enterprise so i think what i'm keen to sort of emphasize is don't yes have big aspirations but don't forget that local press you know those local publications and you know there's so many podcasts there's so many blogs websites so all you need to do really is go on google and go pet photography you know publications and find what you can in you know drill down to your local area initially and then go wider but I would say everyone can potentially do this, but it might just mean starting really small, you know, yeah. and going well, for that local angle. Even starting with local, like maybe the actual physical paper readership is down, but they're still reading things online and there's still online articles. And that becomes like SEO juice because there's likely then a link to your business Absolutely. on that website. So that yeah. becomes really valuable. Completely. I mean, back in the day when I started in PR, you know, newspapers was where it was at with with in terms of local press, you know, we wanted right. to get in print, the clients wanted to be in print and see their stories and their name in print. But it shifted, you know, because mm-hmm. with the internet, everybody and then people started understanding SEO and the value of backlinks. I mean, for sure, if you were to be featured on a, a website, a publication website, that had a good domain authority score. So every every website has a domain authority score. And if you can rank, I mean, here, the BBC, for example, is our main news channel. That's got like 100 out of 100. This score is out of 100. So, I mean, if you were featured there, you would be in the, then they linked to your website, then that is huge, potentially. Mm -hmm. Um, If if there was a follow link there that, you know, passed kind of like that SEO juice as such. So it adds value to your website by having those links. And I think that's what you're alluding to there. It's really yes. valuable to be featured in the press because they are typically going to have much, much higher, if not rock solid domain authority scores, which means mm-hmm. that that's really beneficial from an SEO point of view. And if you were to Google someone who has been featured in the press by their name or their business name, you will find that probably their website will come up first, Mm -hmm. but a close second, the third and fourth will be those media placements. Um, And that's what you would expect because Google understands that that's a valuable piece of of content. You know, it's it's from an, on an important website. So Yeah. yeah. So print media has its benefits. It's physically in people's hands. I mean, despite the numbers going down in terms of readership, um, you know, around the world, people do still, I mean, people buy books still, right? We don't have to. We can buy Kindle and, you know, but I'm personally a massive book lover. I love having a book in my hands. And it's the same with magazines. Still get a monthly magazine subscription, deliver it to my door, read it every month, (laughs) love that. Because it's just not the same and it's time off your phone, isn't it? It's less screen time and just to chill out. A way of kind of, yeah, just engaging with information in different ways. And people will still do that no matter how important the internet becomes to us. Yeah, I agree. Um, but equally, yeah, online now is, is obviously so important from that backlink perspective. Mm-hmm. So in an ideal world, you'd be featured in print, online, in blogs, kind of everywhere, podcasts, it all, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, agree. I agree. Yeah, there's, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. One other question before we wrap this up, and that is, are there best practices? So we have some ideas of what we might want to pitch. We've figured out who to maybe pitch. Are there best practices for actually pitching? 
definitely so i mean yes once once you've decided who you're going to pitch to and i forgot to mention just now actually twitter is a really great mm. social media channel to be on in regards to connecting with the press so it's not a channel that well not many photographers i've come across are on, right. are on twitter um but they may be a registered and then abandoned it realizing that it wasn't for them but it still remains despite all the changes going on recently with elon musk um, ownership <laughs> <Right>. etc <laughs> uh, it still remains a great place for reaching journalists and that's where you can not only search for them by name by publication but you know connect with them follow them start commenting start liking um, their stuff even even ask you know if you can pitch to them directly through the dms you know that sort of thing yeah but yeah, it's all about once you've got that media list, sort of really nailing what the story is that make what is it that's unique. Um, mm-hmm. And I really wouldn't recommend making any approach if if that's a bit hazy in your mind. You need to be clear what it is the story that you're, you know, trying to sell, and really spend some time crafting. Not necessarily a press release, but a press release. People say, oh, press releases are dead. I don't think they are. Press release is not dead. People have been saying blogging's dead. It's right. not dead. Yeah, it's just something that we used to do a lot of in the PR industry, writing press releases. It was kind of how you formed your story. I have to admit, I don't write as many press releases these days, but it's a really good practice because it helps you to shape the story and really condense it, refine it and make it sure that if you follow the format of a traditional press release, you're really getting in the key, the who, the why, the what, the where, Mm -hmm. you know, all of that key information. I do actually have a press release template available as a resource if anyone wants to grab that from my website. But that, I would say, is a really good way to start and to, in terms of the process, because you really want to hone that story and refine it. And that press release format kind of encourages you to do that. And the point being that if a journalist was to give you like five, ten seconds of their time scanning your email, that first paragraph will tell them everything they need to know. And that is what the structure of a press release is like, key information at the top and then padded out with a bit more information, less important details at the bottom. Um, So if they were to grace your, you know, your email with a bit of their attention, then, you know, they can get the key, the key details. So, yeah, you've got to find the right person. You've got to compile your story in a compelling way. And you've got to think about like a headline, because, again, we can't assume that they're actually even going to click open the email. They may see it in their inbox. But the headline is going to be really important. So again, I wouldn't spend like half an hour on a headline, but I would certainly give it 10, 15 minutes of thought just to really refine it because you don't want to just put anything that's just not going to get their interest because chances are your email won't get opened. So, um, you know, do spend 10, 15 minutes or so really refining the headline. And you can even go online, you know, this headline kind of, tools um ai right. perhaps could help you you know now now shape a really compelling headline come up with some different options i would say that when you're writing blogs as well you know come up with 10 different blog headlines and pick the one that you feel is the strongest don't just necessarily go with the first one that you've come up with because in the case of being in a journalist's inbox you've only got a few seconds to, oh, to absolutely. grab their attention mm-hmm. and you yeah. know, make sure that hook that story that news angle is very visible in that in that headline whatever it is that you choose and then once you've actually you've you've obtained the email address i mean we are talking about emailing journalists here and that's making an assumption that you would you would do that you would absolutely do that because journalists don't want you calling them unless you've got a personal contact if it's someone that you know um or have chatted to before and you have maybe their direct dial or something, you will find that if you try to call a news desk, you'll just not get an answer. And if you will get an answer It won't be a good one. (laughs) It might not be a good one, you know, you've got like two seconds to say what it is you want to say, and invariably, yeah, that might not go down well. Um, And that's kind of tarnishing all journalists with the same kind of assumptions, but it's, it's... it's not always they're the busy. I mean, it's the same as busy. we've talked about, like when you want to partner with different rescues and things like that and other charities for some of yeah. these charitable events, like they're really busy and they're strapped and like totally. we need to make it easy for them. So completely. Yeah. That's that's really important to be mindful of. You know, journalists mm-hmm. do want to hear your stories. You know, they can't produce their content, their publications without stories, particularly if they're local and, you know, they need community news. 
So don't be put off by the fear of being spoken to by a scary journalist. Um, right. But at the same time, you know, equally be mindful that they have got commitments. There's, the teams are smaller than ever and they've got to produce more content than ever. So yeah. they're stretched for time, resources are thin, you know, so and tempers maybe, maybe, you know, on the verge of flaring at any moment, perhaps. So yeah, an ill-timed phone call is probably not the best thing to do. And you will never know when's a good time and when's a bad time. So email right. first, um, always email. And yeah, like I say, get that headline really compelling. Include not like a chapter and verse kind of full length story, just a few paragraphs summarizing yeah. the story. And could you possibly be interested in this? in this and maybe a couple of lines about why that might be particularly timely or newsworthy is it linked with a recent story that broke in the press nationally right. you know it's your angle on it from a local perspective for example um and then yeah and sit hold and sit and sort of wait see if you can get a response i think that's really the process you can follow up you can absolutely follow up and sort of say oh didn't hear anything you know have you been able to check my email I have had loads of coverage over the years purely from the fact that I followed up. Right. Because I mean, I miss things in my email and it's probably yeah. not as busy as a journalist. <laughs> We're all drowning in emails, let's yeah. face it, and uh-huh. things get missed. So that almost harks back to that point we made earlier, didn't it? About like, don't think it's about you. If you don't hear anything, it might just be genuinely that a journalist is so busy mm-hmm. that they missed it. They might have dismissed it and thought, no, not for me. But you won't know unless you follow up. So I would say follow up, but only if you're pretty confident that that journalist yeah. should have been interested in that, that angle. Okay, um, sounds good. What about sending, like, I have a pitch ready. Do you send it out to more than one at first? Or do you, like, kind of go down the list and wait, okay, let me send it to person A and see if I hear. And then, okay, now I'll move to person B. It depends completely on the story, which isn't, that helpful I guess but yeah. um if it was like a press release is typically a story right. that is going to go to everyone to at once yep. but journalists do and publications do love exclusives so if they get the chance to have the story first if it's a particularly strong story really juicy that they would absolutely love um they are going to love that if you say offering it to you first um you know just wanted to see if this is of interest would you like to do an exclusive and the expectation on your behalf then is that they may do a bigger spread on it than they might have done had it been a press release and I think that's a really good tactic if there is a perfect publication that you have in mind and your story you feel fits that publication really well because as soon as you've put it out there to everyone on your media list that potential for you know an exclusive is obviously gone um and the appeal for each publication is perhaps diminished slightly because Mm -hmm. they know that it's gone to everyone but it will completely depend on the news story, on, on what it is that you're sharing. More often than not, you will probably blitz it to quite a few publications. But, you know, you might want to try that kind of exclusive tactic first. If Again, yeah. if you've got personal connections with a journalist, you think it's pretty dead cert that you might be featured. You certainly wouldn't harm you to sort of suggest that, oh, if I could give this to you as an exclusive. And yeah, if there's, if there's interest there, you could really do something quite special, potentially, that you would not have got had you you know, sent it out yeah. to everyone. Yeah, I love that. Um, oh the my other gosh. thing on yeah. that, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, go, go, go. That just yeah. reminded okay. me of another key point and I really need to mention it is lead times of publications mm, because yes. in terms of who you're sending out a public uh, story to, it will depend on the lead time. So if you're targeting longer leads, which are print publications, you know, three yeah, to magazines. six months. Exactly. <laughs> Three to six months in advance, they'll be planning their content. I mean, there will be national women's mags, for example, will be, you know, planning Christmas 2023 right. in literally the next few weeks. Right. Um, because they'll be starting to plan the, plan the sections and what they're going to include. If you're talking about your local newspaper, their lead time is going to be a lot less, a lot right. shorter. So you can approach them with a story on the Monday and it be in the print by the Tuesday or the Wednesday. Right. Um, same for online publications so I couldn't stop without sort of talking about that because that's important to consider as well yeah um, from a timing point of view you know you don't want to be trying to pitch a Valentine's story on like f- February 13th you know love right pet right day yeah. or something um yeah and like, in terms of awareness days and things there's loads of pet related awareness days that um you know pet photographers can use as hooks potentially for PR mm-hmm. also yeah. content content and social media content but you really need to be thinking about that lead time, like how early 
in advance of that do you need to be getting in touch if you're trying to get PR publicity? Yeah, um, no, that's yeah. a fantastic point. Thank you. Is there anything else as we wrap up? Is there anything else like to kind of wrap this up to encourage our pet photographers out there or anything else that you want to, to tell them? This has been think, full of so much good, juicy information. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, I just, I just really hope it's hopefully inspired um, your listeners really to sort of try this out if they've never have and to do more yeah. of it if they've had some success because it is actually a tactic that, you know, a lot of pet, pet photographers are not using. So, you know, you really are in the minority if you're being proactive with your mm -hmm. PR and the potential is there. As I've already said, like journalists do want your news. You are interesting, you know, your story, your business, what you do, how you help people. It's all really good stuff. Um, yeah. And if people are interested in chatting to you in the pub or in the coffee shop about your business, then chances are they're going to be in interested in reading about it in a newspaper. And so don't forget how special what it is that you do is, you know, that that is unique work, what you're doing. And yeah, just go out and, and spread it and tell tell the stories and don't get disheartened if you can with, with any kind of level of rejection. Um, yeah. Because, you know, it's just, just part going. of the Just part of the course. <laughs> it's part of it. And then if you do get featured in the press, shout about it, you know, tell right. everyone, get it on your socials, get it in your newsletters, you know, talk about it, feature it here, there and everywhere, mm -hmm. because that's, that's a really big uh, win. And I think- Yeah, that builds, I think you mentioned that at the beginning that the any sort of press we get like that builds so much trust because you don't pay for it. It's not something that, that, you know, like an advertisement, people already know, oh, they just paid for that. So they just kind of tune those out. Whereas yeah. when there's a story, it's like, oh, well, there's a reason this is interesting because they wrote a story on it. And Completely. Just, yeah. yeah, that credibility is enhanced so much because someone else, I've got a quote actually that links to what you've just said there. And it's um, advertised, not my quote, I must say, but a yeah, yeah. quote that kind of floats out in the internet. Um, <laughs> advertising is saying you're good and PR is getting someone else to say you're yes. good. So yes. it's really powerful, that one. And, you know, you want to get talked about. That's that's the reality. As a business owner, you've got to make sales, you've got to generate inquiries and you've got to attract clients. And whilst, you know, I'm a PR specialist and I will talk forever about PR, um, it's, it's definitely a strategy to try, not to the exclusion of anything else. I believe it should be part of your marketing strategy whilst you're right. doing the email marketing, the social yeah. media. Yeah. You might even be doing paid ads to get visible. You know, it's, it's a combination of combining everything. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly if you haven't ever tried it, then give it a go in 2023. Why not? Yes, I love it. I love it. Oh my gosh, Zoe, this has been so good. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Cammie's very excited. She's been oh. awesome. so, <laughs> no, thank, thank you. you. It's an honor to have been invited. <laughs> thank you so much. Of course. Can you let us know where um, everyone can find you online? Yes. Um, my website is Zoe Hill Jamark, so it's my name, dot com. So it's Z-O-E-H-I-L-J-E-M-A-R-K.com. And I, like I said, I've got a freebie press release template and loads of other freebies, including um, a download of Awareness Days for 2023. I did touch on that just a minute ago and they Perfect. could be really good hooks for content. So lots of other things in there. It's like a library of free resources. So if anybody wants to join that, then they're very welcome. And I've got a PR Savvy Photographers Facebook group um, open to all as well. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll put those links in the show notes, everyone. And um my gosh, Zoe, thank you again. This thank has been you. so fun. Aww. And um, we will talk to you soon. I've loved Bye, it. Everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you.